This material is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's Oral History Program, Living Legends Collection. We have no original date for this material. This material is a tribute to Senator Mike Monroney of Oklahoma by an unidentified organization. Also on this tape is a speech of tribute about Senator Mike Monroney by Senator Hale Boggs of Louisiana. This material was re-recorded on October the 29th, 1985 for inclusion in the permanent collections of the Oral History Program by Judith Michener. successful $1,700,000 United Appeal campaign through Western Electric's corporate gift and a contribution by every one of their 3,000 plus employees. The Western Electric Fund has contributed $10,000 to Oklahoma City's great, Oklahoma City University's great plan program. For the benefit of some of our visitors, this great plan of OCU is a marriage between MIT and Oklahoma City University to develop a university of excellence at OCU. The university held its first annual meeting of the great plan contributors to the two and a half million dollar great plan fund on November 1st. Dr. Gerald Sarhas, Zacharias, of MIT, the speaker at this meeting, said from this platform just 17 days ago, if the present acceleration of progress continues, and I believe that it will, in 15 to 20 years, Oklahoma City University will be one of the great universities of the world. Jim, this community greatly appreciates this $10,000 grant to OCU. And I would like at this time to give our people a chance to express their appreciation to you in any manner that they may see fit. And now, Jim, since you're one bite ahead of me on your lunch, I would like to know if you wouldn't like to uh, make an expression here for us. Thank you very much, President John, <coughs> Senator Maroney, distinguished guests. It is with a great deal of pleasure that we have one more uh, announcement that I think is timely in Oklahoma City, and that is that our Board of Directors has approved a $3 million expansion in our facilities. <laughs> This expansion will provide for the manufacture of a new product. Uh, when we built our plant at this location, adequate space was provided for quite a bit of expansion. The significant thing, I think, as far as Oklahoma City is concerned, is that conservatively, we estimate that it will mean over 300 new jobs. Now, this, this will... Uh, to put the thing in the proper time focus, with this authorization, the necessary engineering, design, and procurement of the machinery and tools necessary will be taking place, or actually is underway right now. So it is my estimate that it will be sometime uh, within the next 10 to 15 months that uh, these new jobs will be a part of the Oklahoma City payroll. Thank you. Present our distinguished speaker of the day. In my 
my pleasure to call on a man who is kind of a newcomer to Oklahoma City, but is one of our truly great citizens of this state, of this city, of this country, and of this world. And it's my privilege to call on Mr. Dell W. Remsel, who is National Counselor for the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce, a member of our Board of Directors, and President of Woods Industries. Dell Remsel. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a double pleasure here today, not only in introducing a great man whom we all know, but introducing a new member of the Congressional Delegation of Oklahoma at large. I refer to the Honorable Hale Box, who is supposed to be a congressman from Louisiana, but on so many occasions has acted like a congressman from Oklahoma. from New Orleans. I think we've all been there. We may get to go back, uh, assuming that Oklahoma gets a chance to go to the Sugar Bowl. Well, I'm not promising, but I think it looks good for next year. <laughs> Congressman Bobbs is a senior member of the Ways and Means Committee of the House of Representatives, which just coincidentally is the group who decides how much taxes we're going to pay, and that makes him sort of important to us for another reason. He's, uh, I think, a good friend of the citizens of the United States because Hale is not one of those who wants to whip stitch a new tax bill through uh, the carpet. He also has been a great champion of depletion, which is of some importance to, here, to us here in Oklahoma. He is a great friend of the interstate highway system, which the maps will show converge on Oklahoma City. He's a good friend of aviation, the second most important industry in our state. He has been with Mike, a, the co-sponsor of a number of airport bills, all of which have been extremely helpful to us here. He is a member of the Interpart Interparliamentary Union, Interparliamentary Union. I'll get it out in a minute. <laughs> I can't, I don't have that smooth speech that Johnny K had. I could go on uh, for a long list of uh, accomplishments on the part of our good friend, Congressman Hale Bogg, but I think one of the nicest things I can say about him, he's a very close friend of our Union Senator from Oklahoma, Mike Monroney. I'd like to present Congressman Hale Bach. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Senator Monroney, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I must say that I'm surprised. I uh, was told that I would be introduced to take a bow, but uh, might I say that unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, <laughs> possibly I should uh, uh, take advantage of this opportunity, particularly in view of the fact that uh, uh, in light of the nice, flattering, complimentary things that uh, Bill said about me, I may have to be running in Oklahoma literally before too long. You know, they tell the story about the congressman who was uh, running for re-election, and all congressmen always are running for re-election. And this fellow went everywhere, including the state penitentiary, which happened to be in his district. And his visit coincided with the electrocution of some poor devil. And the warden saw him coming and tried to shake him, but he couldn't. So he grabbed him by the arm and impatiently hauled him into the death chamber. And there sat the condemned, strapped in the chair with the electrodes on, and the warden turned to the condemned and said, Mr. Condemned, under the practice prevailing here, you have 20 minutes to say anything you like before we pull the switch. This fellow said, no, thank you, Mr. Warden. I've tried to make my peace with my maker. 
I'm innocent, but nobody believes it but me. Go ahead and pull the switch. And with that, the congressman raised his right hand and said, now look at here, Mr. Ward. If that fellow's not going to use that 20 minutes, I'd like to have it to speak on behalf of my candidacy for re-election to Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Thereupon, the warden turned to the condemned and asked for his consent, and he said it was all right with him, but for God's sakes, electrocute him first. <laughs> well, now, I frankly can't imagine a happier occasion than to be present at a, at a luncheon honoring uh, Senator Mike Monroe. I first went to the Congress back in 1941, and Mike was already there. As a matter of fact, uh, for some years, we served on the House Banking and Currency Committee together. And I think that I know Mike and Mary Ellen and young Mike uh, as well as anyone in Washington. And I say to you uh, that I know of no person in either body who has distinguished himself more, both on the, the national level and the international level, than Mike Monroney. He is a <laughs> The great speaker of the House, who now uh, has left us, uh, used to say to all of us that we had two constituencies to please. First, and of course the essential one was the people that we had the honor of representing. But if we were to perform for those people, if we were to do anything for them, we also had a constituency made up of our colleagues in the House and in the Senate. This latter constituency is a much harder one to pass, believe it or not, than the people who elect us, because they're all professionals. They're able to spot a fellow pretty quickly. They know a man who is able, who is sincere, who is dedicated, and they know the frauds and the fakers. I can say to you that Mike Monroney, from the very beginning, has passed both of those tests with flying colors. So I am pleased to see that uh, this seems to be Mike Monroney week. I saw in this morning's paper where he had been elected to the Hall of Fame of your great state. I saw in the Tulsa paper where he was on the front page there, having made a major address uh, in that city on yesterday. So I'm happy to be here for Mike Monroney week, and I'm particularly happy to be at this luncheon where he is being honored. And while it may sound like a cliche, I mean it sincerely. In honoring him, you honor yourselves. Thank you very much. on this rostrum about uh, 11 years ago, a little more, 12, that I came to town with Mike, and it was one of those days when I was being made an Indian chief. An impressive ceremony, one which uh, came very close to me. As a matter of fact, it was that day that I decided this is where I wanted to live. It took me a little while to get here, but uh, I did make it, and I'm very happy about it. But I think in talking about Mike a little bit, uh, we might remember a couple of important things. Number one, he's been your representative here in the Congress a number of years before he became senator, and he was so good there that he won the Collier Trophy, Collier Award for Outstanding congressional dedication and achievement. What a lot of you may not know, Mike doesn't do much talking about it, is that he won $10,000 along with that award. And that $10,000 became the, as his gift, as part
part of the, the basic founding of Catholic school here on the north side of town. Uh, that, I think, is a, a sort of a, an accurate measurement of, of the generosity and the feeling of this man. Since he's been in the Senate, Mike has done a tremendous number of things to compound his achievements in the House. As you all know, he's the chairman of the Aviation Committee, and as you all know, aviation is the second and most important industry to this state. And it's no complete accident that the respect and admiration with which Mike is held in aviation circles have attracted a great deal of industry to this city and to the state as a whole. In addition to that, on six occasions, to my knowledge, Mike has taken the floor to fight for the oil and gas industry. I observed personally for three days the skillful manner in which he led the fight for the passage of the gas bill in the last, in the Congress of 1958. He did a beautiful job bill was passed, although it was not signed by the president, did an outstanding job, but he's done it every year. So I have to say that he's a friend of the oil and gas industry of this state. As a trucker, I've had good uh, first-hand knowledge of his understanding of the trucking industry. I'd have to say, without any further ado, he's a good friend of the trucking industry. I think those of us in the education field would have to say that Mike has done a great job in fighting for the proper educational system and the necessary support for that system. So you'd have to say he's a friend of education. In highways, I don't need to comment too much. Mike has been a leader in trying to get an adequate system of national state highways and is therefore a friend of anyone interested in highways. You could go on and list, uh, well, take the post office, for example. Mike is on the post office and civil service committee of the Senate as the second ranking member. And uh, without any disparagement to the senior member, I think he's the most influential member of that committee. We have good post office facilities in this state, good postal distribution system, and I think he can take a little credit for that. And therefore, you have to say that he's a friend of the distribution system afforded us by the post office. So about the best thing I can say in closing about Mike, just in introducing him to you, is I think he's a friend of everybody in Oklahoma, Mike Monroe. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and the accompanying commercials that it contained. I do appreciate the, that very, very much. President Kilpatrick, Congressman Boggs, General Mundell, General Johnson, Mayor Norrie, Mr. Doherty, and friends, and also the Oklahoma City University Choir and Mr. Nielsen. This is a grand day to be allowed to be here part of your annual of your weekly meeting and also to have a chance to visit with you this is a rather strange coincidence because yesterday i spoke to the uh, tulsa chamber of commerce i was invited to speak to them as a uh, post uh, inaugural of the brand new airport terminal there it seems they're not inviting senators to cut any more ribbons since uh, Big Cedar. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry that my dear colleague Bob can't be here. We are the best of friends, as he often says, I'm the best junior senator in the United States Senate. And I say I want to be the oldest junior senator in the United States Senate. But we do have a little bit of rivalry not to the point where some people claim that we're in a race, that Bob is seeing if he can get more of Oklahoma underwater than I can get it under concrete. Uh, <laughs> but I, I literally had to go into aviation 
you know, Bob got to the Senate two years before I did, and you know how Bob operates, and when I got there, he'd taken over land, wood, and water. <laughs> well, there's nothing else on the face of the earth but land, wood, and water, so I had to go into aviation, and I was doing pretty well, I thought, looking down from on high on Bob's land, wood, and water. And Lyndon Johnson got himself elected to the vice presidency. He gave up the chairmanship of outer space. And so Bob detoured around my atmosphere, and now he's on top with space and underneath with land, wood, and water, and I'm just an atmospheric sandwich. And so, uh, best part of the senatorial or congressional service, I know Congressman Hale will agree, is when we're in adjournment. It's better for us, it's better for the country, too, because you, you get to see the growth and the development of projects which used to be merely statistics and figures, and while the session went a long, long time, it was a record-breaking peacetime session, I think we're the only legislative body that outsat the Oklahoma State Legislature. <laughs> I've made one of the most eloquent and soul-searching speeches uh, late one night before adjournment. I thought I had done beautifully well, and I was strutting down in front of the vice president's rostrum, and two little sleepy-eyed page boys were down there. Uh, I couldn't hear what the first one said, but the second little kid said, hell, I don't even let it go in one ear. <laughs> But you get to see such things as I saw about 10 days ago and coming back from the air traffic controllers meeting at Miami where we were checking the radio beacons uh, at 25,000 feet with a prop jet conveyor. You could check 100 miles half wide within an accuracy with the electronic equipment of 500 feet of the accuracy of some 100 radio beacons en route. And in order to place the plane in its proper flight, because the position of the plane is the important thing, this plane was completely automated. The pilot didn't have a thing to do after we went over the Jacksonville, Florida Omni, and the IBM tape machine speeded up the airplane, slowed it down, lifted its altitude, all on a pre-planned flight course to give the most total and complete accuracy uh, that man could not give. And it reminded me of the story that you may have heard a few years hence where sound comes on from a cockpit and says, ladies and gentlemen, you're now flying on the very fine DC-10. This is uh, the latest product of American genius of electronics and skill. Uh, this is flight uh, Pan Am Flight 40, our en route to Orly Field, Paris. Our flight time is three hours. We expect now at 10,000 feet, we expect to reach our cruising altitude at 40,000 feet. Then now, when you get to the cruising altitude, go forward to the uh, drink buffet, mix yourself whatever you like. When you finish, uh, retire to the food buffet in the rear and serve yourself. We don't have time. We regret to serve you on the plane. Now, the one thing that is very unusual and unique about this plane uh, it is completely and totally automated. In fact, there are no pilots, nor co-pilots, nor flight engineers aboard. But we want you to feel perfectly comfortable because this has been thoroughly tested. It is absolutely safe and nothing can go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong. <laughs> this, was, this was about the fix we were in when we got to Texarkana and we hit a line of Oklahoma Thunder stuff and uh, pilots put their newspapers down and went back to work. I'm glad to be here, particularly shortly after the greatest victory in my memory for the progress of Oklahoma City. When Oklahoma had the daring and the courage to take a step forward with seven league boots to move into the modern future, the future that the pioneers that founded this city that wrestled to bring the railroads here and the packing plants and all the other things would have been proud of to see Oklahoma City move this way. I was in Tulsa. They were proud of their $4 million bond issue, and I reminded them that ours was 10 times as much and to look out for 10 times as much progress. Because I do feel that our greatest day in Oklahoma City 
lie ahead in your courage in participating in these forward-looking projects so necessary for a city's growth. If we're to take care of the population, we will attract here. It requires a capital investment to meet those needs, or else you have to invite these people to move elsewhere or to stay in their homes from which they came. We hope in Washington, with our congressional team, John Jarman, Bob Kerr, myself, and other dedicated members of the Congress, to meet you in this great development, because we intend to match you and go forward in the greatest program of the development of Oklahoma resources of which we are capable and for which economically sound projects provide. And this, I am sure, will include all fields. Naturally, I am interested in aviation. As Dell has said, this is one of the great income producers of the state of Oklahoma. Agricultural first with 850 million per year, oil second with 630 million, and aviation a growing little brother with 335 million. Here in Oklahoma City, on one side of town, you have the great military establishment, one of the largest, if not the largest, and one of the most important. And on the other side of town, you have the great civil university of the air, of the world there, matching on the military side with the civilian side. And then out at, Will, at Wiley Post, you have the great center and the finest General Aviation Airport with the aerial commander, which is going to bring out the first low-cost uh, all-jet uh, executive aircraft and is being considered for bids on the new air cargo plane, the C-141, that will soon be built by Lockheed. So we have reason to be proud of these establishments. They represent a lot of hard work and long hours by Stanley Draper men like your president uh, Kilpatrick and many others that have gone before. The Tinker Field payroll is approximately 20,000, including the military. The FAA payroll is about 3,000 and still growing strong. Figuring an average of three members of a family to each family head, this will give measured on the population of Oklahoma County one out of every six families, which is going to bring out the first low-cost uh, all-jet uh, executive aircraft and is being considered for bids on the new air cargo plane, the C-141, that will soon be built by Lockheed. So we have reason to be proud of these establishments. They represent a lot of hard work and long hours by Stanley Draper and men like your president, uh, Kilpatrick, and many others that have gone before. The Tinker Field payroll is approximately 20,000, including the military. The FAA payroll is about 3,000, and that's still growing strong. Figuring an average of three members of a family to each family head, this will give, measured on the population of Oklahoma County, one out of every six families employed in these two great aviation establishments. I think you might gather some of the importance of Tinker Field by this air chart here, which marks the greatest air cargo movement today in the world. And this is Tinker Field in the center. And these are the log air lines that fan out of here. The red lines, I believe, being the Argosy, the only truly configured cargo plane, and the others, the DC-6 and the DC-3 flight. And if you don't think Oklahoma, like the early pioneers, has put down their stake in the dead center of the air cargo field, you are missing what is happening in this great new frontier that lies ahead for aviation, for Oklahoma City, for the nation, and for the world. This is the one that has the greatest growth potential. And there are other things still in mind. This is the central dispatching post for all points in the world using Boeing aircraft. And if you can figure out very much that's not on the fighting front that's not Boeing, I miss my guess. The B-52 
the B-52s, the KC-135. This is the mother plant that services with parts and equipment, with major overhaul and repair, this great fleet that today is the strong arm of America's defense. Then another thing that you don't see very often, and this is the communications network for the entire combat logistics network for the combined services of the Army Air Force, the, for the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy, all with the central switching position here that is just now being completed. It also serves some of our special missile contracts. It represents a government investment of three quarters of a million in the latest electronic equipment and will have a speed equal to the capacity of moving 130 million words per day. Measured another way on the automated punch cards it will handle, it can handle 10 million automated punch cards, which before it was automated would handle only 10 million per month. So more can move on this network in one day than has heretofore moved in one month. It is a government partnership with the equipment being furnished by Western Union, Radio Corporation of America, and IBM, who will install $20 million worth of electronic equipment. And of course, these things will all have to be serviced locally. General Johnson controls the missile control site for the general Midwestern states in this great weapon of aerial defense. And there are other military installations that are coming into Oklahoma, some quite large that may be in the office. The FAA Center, which we dearly love and greatly respect, it is the World University of the Air, the Medical Administrative Center, will be located here, as you read this week when Chief Hallaby was here, to add to the Medical Research Center, which had already been located here. This perhaps means more than the initial movement of these great professional men, but I have a hunch that the medical records, which are in Washington, may be joined with the pilot's proficiency records, uh, which are here someday because this is where the medical examiners and the appeals should go. And so this is another step forward. Another big one which we are working on and a bill which I introduced just before the Congress closed is a Federal Aviation Service, a quasi-military service that will meld the civilian air traffic control which must be operative as a primary point of our traffic movement with the military. And so this great new service will, we hope, lead to increasing from the 560 civilian control towers now operated by men trained in the Oklahoma City Center to 600 more that operate the military control towers and thus relieve our fighting airmen of this onerous job that requires long continuity of service and allow them to concentrate more on the more important combat uh, steps that must be taken. I swell with pride when I think of this great University of the Air, the World Center. When you come in, as I did a couple of years ago from the Franklin D. Roosevelt carrier a couple hundred miles off Turkey, watching the war games and Listen to the pilot in the cockpit file his flight plan over Athens and on to Rome and hear the same procedure that you would hear if you were more important combat uh, steps that must be taken. I swell with pride when I think of this great University of the Air, the World Center. When you come in, as I did, a couple of years ago from the Franklin D. Roosevelt carrier a couple hundred miles off Turkey, watching the war games and listen to the pilot in the cockpit file his flight plan over Athens and on to Rome and hear the same procedure that you would hear if you were coming into Oklahoma City or Tulsa and filing your flight plan on beyond. And it did my heart good to hear a Greek giving the standard flight 
plan instructions over Athens speaking English with an Oklahoma accent. <laughs> and may I congratulate you people in Oklahoma City of doing the finest job of making these students from foreign lands very important people in their own country realize the American way of life, our Western hospitality, and above all to see how American families live because you have sent back some of the finest ambassadors of goodwill to the far off corners of the earth who use our air traffic system than any city in the United States, I believe. Now going back to Tinker for a minute, we have, as I said, a great payroll there, but I think we're missing the big and great opportunity. The military payroll, of course, is the biggest in the state of Oklahoma, but uh, the payroll at Tinker, including the military, of 126 millions of dollars. But we're missing the great opportunity that is on beyond that. And that is that through the Oklahoma City Air Material Center that is located there, $700 million of new purchases per year are made through this headquarters. This includes the purchases of new equipment from prime manufacturers, the overhaul of aircraft construction, various components and parts, purchasers of major and minor kits for repair and service, and then contract and construction. $700 million worth of business placed with private industry just at our very border. And yet Oklahoma City contracts total $22 million a year. And most of that was in concrete and runway and uh, construction of buildings. This is in despite of the pleas made by General Mundell and General Garrity and General Center and others who have urged a greater participation. The potential for Oklahoma firms is at least $150 million on things that we can do. We can't manufacture jet engines now, we might later, but on the things that we can do, it is easily $150 million a year seven times the amount of work that we are doing today. It includes overhaul of aircraft parts and accessories, $11 million a year, fabrication of small kits to support aircraft maintenance programs, such as kits, seals, washers, and so forth, assembled in packages, standard common items. Local firms who have bid, and I accent this, have bid, have been reasonably successful when they bid. But, generally on construct, but these are generally on construction, repair and maintenance of ground vehicles. May I remind you that the competition from out of the state is getting more severe on these two rather simple items. Oklahoma firms, I am told, and I believe this, must be more competitive because Senator Curd nor John Jarman nor I or any other congressman can ask this base to pay more on the same bid we can get our pencil sharp as we do in other lines which we know better. We can study the needs and engineer to meet the problem. And so I feel that there is this great golden opportunity that if we use the same courage, a little bit of daring, a little bit of the initiative that found oil a mile underground in Oklahoma, this industry we understand. But we can learn if we try to understand the complicated kits and things and parts that offer such a fertile field for the vast expansion of our own industries here located. Our oil well supply people are competent in these fields of close tolerance. And it breaks my heart to see us getting only 22 million out of what could easily be 150 million of industry moving in and building by your own free enterprise effort and your low bid into this great field. For example, last year, of all things, Oklahoma lost the contract for the bread supply at Tinker Field, and we saw it bought in Kansas.
this year, the pencils got a little sharper, and it's back in Oklahoma. But on all these things, if this is a minor item, we can be competitive if we have this parent. And thus, this great benefit will fall to all who live and who work here and the employment we have hope to have. And in addition to this, we will help build an industrial complex that will truly make us the center of the magic circle of aviation. This is the magic circle of aviation. You have the McDonnell Aircraft Company in St. Louis, one of the great firms that manufacture the jet. We're the center of this circle. On the other side of the circle is the great Boeing plane, a great subcontractor of many parts at Wichita. And on around the circle, you have the Convair plant at Fort Worth and a complex of aviation plants at Dallas not to mention Vance Air Force Base, the two strategic air command bases, Douglas Aircraft and American Airlines major overhaul and pump. So we have the seeds for growing the giant trees of aviation. We only have to use this same daring and courage to move forward and we can do it. Oklahoma City, as I say, has made its steps with seven league boots in voting airport construction funds for the acquisition of more lands and dual runway, for the improvement of its streets and the ability to get out to our great industrial plant. We will try to keep in step with you from the federal angle. We have many things, I think, that people here do not realize. Under the leadership of Senator Kerr, the authority on water development, I can say to you that Oklahoma has the greatest water resource development of any state in the Union. No other state will have the availability of pure industrial water, of water power, and of navigation, and all of the other blessings that the conservation of this most vital resource to mankind. We will have the greatest uncommitted supply as this program nears completion within some five or six years. May I remind you that the course of history follows the waterway, and when water disappears, civilizations perish as it did in Egypt, or in Rome, or in Athens. But when the waterways are developed and the water utilized to its best, civilizations grow. And so we will find this industrial expansion that came into Tennessee with the TVA. Filling up all of their water resources will be looking for the next place to expand, and Oklahoma will have the resources to support it. Yes, we have a little conflict to have had in the, between the upstream dams and the major reservoirs. I ran against major reservoirs when I first ran, but I am not a man who will not change his mind when I am convinced that there is a place for both. So Bob Kerr and I now are working together on this as most of those others because the small dam managed to make and yield twice the investment by catching the silt and topping off the flood peaks, stabilizing the water flow and purifying it from the pollution before it reaches our main stem waterways for industry and growing population to utilize. So Bob Kerr takes care primarily of initiating the senior dams. I take care of the junior dams, and we're going to have the best dam program in the United States. <laughs> and then you took a broad step forward with the bond issue, but more than that, in settling the long-standing dispute over urban redevelopment. Thank heaven you have appointed an able and a competent commission headed by a very outstanding Oklahoman, Mr. Granville Tomerlin, and I know you will begin to move at long last on this vital necessity of trying to preserve the heart of the municipal center that is a part of a nationwide uh, program to cure urban blight and to correct a bit of the sprawl that has grown up to disintegrate our city. This program is moving forward, and I was afraid that Oklahoma City would be the last in the line. And I know that you're going to want to try to make Oklahoma City 
not only prosperous, not only industrial supreme, but to have Oklahoma City be a clean and beautiful city. And how I wish a few ladies would be put on the directors of the Chamber of Commerce. I don't think you can sell a big deal. For instance, a Lincoln Continental with a dirty shirt and needing a shave. And if you come in on these multi-million dollar through ways as I do and see the auto graveyard staring you in the face where a screen of trees and shrubs or flowers would make a beautiful entry, you will know why I say you need some ladies on the board of directors of the Chamber of Commerce and to make this effort of beauty and attractiveness felt because this city could be one of the most beautiful. It just takes a few ladies with a scrub brush and a broom. And so we have this great opportunity. You're going to pay for urban redevelopment. The other cities are going to be improving their faces, their structure, their housing, their business districts. And I think it's up to you to join into this march of the soaring six. Now maybe you say that I'm not conservative enough to suit you. I don't think he when a city measures up to a conservative city when you vote $40 billion worth of bonds to take care of the growth and the future of Oklahoma City. And I believe a nation must move forward as well as a city. Our population is growing too. When I went to Congress, we had 130 million people, and today it's pushing 180 million people. And new inventions and new devices and new industries require capital investment in the federal government, conservation of natural resources and development just the same as they do a city bond issue. But our accounting is handled differently. If we spend for a large hydroelectric or flood control dam, it's written off the day it's built. Although it has a 50-year life or probably will have a 100-year life with upstream flood control. But we expense it off the day it's built. We put you in the penitentiary you try to expense off the day you build an office building or the way we keep books. And so instead of being deficit spending, this is investing in the capital assets necessary for a growing community. And I believe that the true definition of a conservative is one who conserves. And if we conserve our natural resources, our water, our water power, our transportation, and even our human beings, I think you will find that this is the true historic definition of conservative. I know we're concerned with the current danger, crisis over Berlin. No one can deny that the two powers with the most deadly weapons the world has ever known face each other today across the thin strands are barbed wire. It was extremely dangerous in August because there was a chance of miscalculation. You know, Caesar in his Gallic Wars wrote that emperors and dictators are given information that their servants think they wish to hear. And this was the danger that Khrushchev would get from Brzezinski or others, the fact or the guess that America would not fight for Berlin. Thank heaven the time has run and Mr. Khrushchev has realized that all America realizes that this is the keystone of the ark the Western Wall of Freedom for the World. The loss of Berlin would mean that communism could move unchecked to capture or to see the adherence to communism of the one-third of the world that is neutral and to pick up a good portion of the one-third of the world that is today allied with us in the Grand Alliance. So I feel the danger of miscalculation is perhaps over because America has risen to this danger as we have in the past. And I think the determination of America means a lot. But as we talk about these aviation installations, it's interesting to know that Mr. Khrushchev made a very bad miscalculation. He thought it could be done all with push buttons and the death-dealing missiles 19 minutes from Moscow to New York through outer space would be the answer. We did not think so. We concentrated on shorter range missiles. We concentrated on tactical missiles. But we also concentrated on the long range bomber, knowing that the human being and the human brain in the cockpit 
still was the master of destiny in defense. While Mr. Khrushchev did not produce the heavy bombers, only the prototypes appeared a few months ago. America moved forward with the B-47 and the B-52 and the B-58 and now toward the B-70, the Mach 3 bomber. And Mr. Khrushchev, I think, through the veil and fog that sometimes besets him, has realized that each of these 750 heavy bombers in the SAC command today, poised on a 15-minute takeoff alert at Clinton Sherman Air Force Base and at Altus, can carry in their bomb bays 10 times the megatons of destruction that any single Russian ICBM can carry. And they can get through with new developments that are attached to most of these planes already. And we have the additional element that we don't have to guess at what is hit, as you would with the push-button missile. And if the target has been hit, you have three or four alternate devices. And so this great strength that comes from keeping the man in the cockpit and the courage of producing giant bombers when Mr. Khrushchev thought that they were through, I believe has turned the course of the present threat of danger to another threat. I believe Mr. Khrushchev is looking for a place to turn around, a place to make some soft agreement with a minor gain, to lessen the war tension. But this does not mean that during your lifetimes and mine, the Cold War will not go on. It will move inevitably to another probing front as he seeks to find an empty chair in which the West is not prepared. But further than that, Mr. Khrushchev, I feel, will not risk war. He has spent, and his predecessors have spent, 40 years of human toil and privation and slavery to build an industrial complex today that surpasses either Germany, England, France, or any of the Western nations, and threatening at the present rate growth to catch us by the year 1908. I do not think with the confidence that a dedicated communist such as Mr. Khrushchev has in believing that his slate state system of state bargaining and state barter and state control of export trade and control over the minds and bodies of his 205 million people, that he believes that other than that his system can drive our free enterprise system to its knees and bankruptcy, unemployment, and that communism could take over. I do not think that he would risk this fruit of 40 years to see it turned into a mass of radioactive rubble in one short night. And so I feel our danger, while it will reoccur, is passing for the time being and that there will be a trade war. I think the chances are less for atomic and more for economic warfare. I spoke in Chicago about using oil as the front line penetrating wedge. And as I spoke in Chicago earlier this week, I pointed out Finland as one of the countries that was endangered because they were tied to Russian oil for 95% of their supply. And that by the alliance of trading raw materials for the necessary oil that Russia hoped to take over or to influence the course of these countries. And only a day ago, I saw where Russia insisted on Finland, a dear friend of the West, changing her government and the people in it to more of a communistic state. And so I think this is the path. To summarize, I doubt if President Kennedy's speech at Fort Smith was broadcast here. Everybody was at Big Seat. He made only a three-minute extemporaneous speech. But he mentioned that in leaving Fort Smith, coming in, that this was the hop-off place of our forefathers and the pioneers who came through Fort Smith to move into the new frontier land of Oklahoma, to break out the sod and to clear the brush and to establish a new civilization. There were still wild Indian tribes, but there were some threats on to the west. And Mr. Kennedy said, and so your forefathers in Oklahoma kept one hand on the rifle and one hand on the plow.
This, I think, must be the posture of America. We must stay prepared beyond all chance of challenge because only the strong can be free. And we must be militarily strong as the only defense weapon against the terrors of nuclear nuclear warfare. And so if only the strong can be free, we must build our industry base our muscles of economic power as well as our muscles of military power. For on our strength, war or peace hinges on us. And the chance of the two-thirds of the world, not now under communism, their chances to be free also remain on us. Thank you, thank you very much, Senator Monroney, for such a fabulous speech. In the early part of your speech, you made several challenges to Oklahoma City. And believe me, I think I speak for the entire Chamber of Commerce that we accept these challenges to try to do something about these projects that you mentioned. We hope that we can build a city you and Senator Kerr and our other representatives in Washington will be proud of. Last week, a lot of friends gave Don McBride, who was Senator Kerr's right-hand man, a new automobile. Well, we don't do this every week. We don't have anything to give your right-hand man, except a round of applause. Jay Perry, will you please stand up and take a bow? <laughs> Thank you very much, and you're adjourned.